three, two, one, and we are live on Counterbalance. I'm Mike Duran, and joining me today is Edward Lutbach. Edward, hello. Hi, good afternoon. It's great to have you here. I, you may not know it, but uh, Counterbalance TV is the fastest growing television station in the country, possibly in the world. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm sure after your appearance, it'll be growing even faster. Now, Edward, for the benefit of our viewers, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind. Uh, you are uh, an absolutely unique character, one of a kind. Uh, you are a strategist and a rancher. Uh, you, you own a cattle ranch, but you, you have made your name in the world as a, as a strategist. You have written books about Roman strategy, about Byzantine strategy. You wrote a how-to manual on the coup d'etat, which has been translated into many languages. Uh, you also advise governments. You've advised uh, many parts of the American government over the years, but also uh, foreign governments and, uh, and businesses. Allied governments. Allied governments. Yes, the governments of treaty allies. Of uh, treaty allies. Well, actually... Because the word allies is so vague. Yes, These are but... Uh, they have actual treaties with the U.S. Um, actually, though, uh, I'm going to argue with you about that a little bit, uh, because the, the reason you're here today is that you wrote uh, this book in 2012, The Rise of China and the Logic of Strategy, which, uh, if you'll forgive me for saying, is an absolute brilliant book. I mean, if you'll forgive me for sounding like I'm gushing, it was a, it's a brilliant book. I think... Uh, Everyone should read this book, uh, not just everyone who's interested in China, but it's a, it's a model, I think, of a certain kind of thinking. Um, and what I find particularly impressive about it is that uh, it has the kind of analytical rigor of a political scientist, but with a historian's sensibility. So it doesn't fall prey to any of the kind of uh, silly theorizing of political science, uh, if I may say so. Um, but what's more amazing than that is that it has a great predictive value. Uh, it basically predicted, I think, the situation that we're in with China today. Um, and also, it suggests very strongly what the American strategy should be to counter China. Now, uh, what I'd like to do with you today, if you don't mind, is I'd like you to just describe for us a bit the basic argument of the rise of China and the logic of strategy. Um, but then I'd like to delve in with you into what you think the US strategy should be in this current situation. And then before we end, what I, I really, the, the part of the conversation that I'm most interested in having personally is what your idea of strategy is, because there's a tension in the book between reading of big structural events the sort of the, the sort of grand structures of history and uh, and de designing policy actually where where is human agency in your thinking that's the that's what I want to get at at the end but let's let's start that's a long introduction thanks right. again for coming could you could you just give us uh, in, in a, in a yeah, thumbnail well, the I'll basic you, argument I'll you to, to present uh, this thing first of all um, the book is about China and as it happens, I was one of the earliest visitors to China when it opened up. Uh, not the earliest or anything of the sort, but I was there long before it became anything resembling today's China. Mao Zedong was still alive. There was the Gang of Four. There was a cultural revolution. Waitresses at the Beijing Hotel were not allowed to say Buka Chi, which means no compliments when you said thank you, Xie Xie. They were complete frozen out. But they needed help because 45 Soviet tank and mechanized divisions were focused on Beijing. So they invited a bunch of military experts, as I, I then was, to help them out. And that was a US policy to help them because at that point, as you know, uh, we had embraced China um, in order to offset the catastrophic loss of relative power caused by the Vietnam War, 1975, you know, the collapse of everything, et cetera. So I started traveling then, and then I've been traveling ever since. And I have many friends in China. Moreover, I have not confined myself to Beijing or Shanghai, 
I have gone to Xinjiang, and Mongolia, Tibet, all the remote areas, and lots of other areas less remote, and, and seen more or less the reality on the ground. Now, when the Defense Department, the Office of Net Assessment, then still run by the celebrated Andrew Marshall, the man who stayed in as a civil servant past 90, okay? That was how much he was valued. Um, he asked me to write about Chinese strategy. I was started off by saying, oh, let's look at what the Chinese did in history and so on. Then I realized that it was all wrong because what happened was that China's economic growth and development, we're now back at the year 2000, right? 2000 five or whatever. China's big growth in wealth was in the process of unhinging the Chinese political system. And mm -hmm. I was driven back to the study of Germany, the country that in 1914 on the eve of the First World War had the world's best, uh, you know, mechanical, electrical, pharmaceutical industries, had the world's best universities by far, by far, teaching everybody in the world everything. Not just technical things, but Latin and Greek. And so if you studied at Oxford, you had to first learn German before you could study anything else, whether it was Greek poetry or chemistry, it didn't matter. So they had that, they had finance because Deutsche Bank was the world's largest bank. And then what happened is they became unhinged unhinged and they somehow or other they developed this theory that Germany having being number one in everything was nowhere because it had to have a conquer little islands in the Pacific and therefore <laughs> building a navy building a navy meant that you were rivals of uh, great of the Great Britain of what is now United Kingdom and the British then made up their huge quarrels with the French all over Africa and Asia, all the colonial things that were on the verge of war. They were in 1905, they were on the verge of war. Made it all up, they embraced the French, and now we have the British and the French empires, and then the Russian empire, which should have sided with the Germans and Austrians because they were similar politically, end up with the French because the French financed the, the whole monarchy and everything else, and the Germans therefore start a war with the British Empire, the French Empire, the Russian Empire against them. Eventually they'll have the United States against them and their allies are essentially Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary and Bulgaria, something like that. So in other words, they, what happened to the Germans, the cleverest people in the world, the most intellectual, with the greatest philosophers, the greatest musicians, musicians and everything you wanted, and the greatest scholars by far. What happened is they became unhinged. And then they went on this track and nothing stopped them. Even as they saw that their, their building a fleet, quarreling, you know, starting a war with the British, were ruining everything, they continued doing it. So I decided that they were in a grip of a relentless force, which I called the logic, the unhinged logic of their strategy, which would then trigger reactions. That is to say, who made the British-French alliance after the British and the French have been fighting forever? The Germans. Who forced yeah. Russian Tsar, who loved the Kaiser and the Austrian-Hungarian Emperor and hated the French Republic, of course, the French Republic, which is, you know, anti-monarchist, the Republic, he forced him to go against the Germans. That is what was going to happen. Therefore, I threw all caution to the winds. I gave hostages to fortune and I wrote that China would transition from economic growth that started with the rehabilitation of the China I saw. Beijing was smelled like a toilet. They were moving night soil, which is from people's toilets all around with hand carts. That was Beijing. People with hand carts carrying you know, toilet waste through the city. Going from that to rich wealth and everything, and I said they wouldn't be able to stop themselves. They would start expanding, and then they would repeat everything the Germans did, including the fact that as a land power, which has 27 neighbors or so around it, they would try to become a naval power. 
they will build the fleet, thereby triggering the reaction of the, the uh, naval, men, the, I would say the maritime powers, the maritime powers, Australia, United States, India, Japan, Vietnam, all these insular and peninsular countries would all react against them. And that, and therefore I said that what would happen, that they would emerge an anti-China coalition that would then strangle China and will then additionally go and visit all the neighbors of the Chinese, which is of course the land neighbors. Vietnam has a land border, India, coalition member has a land border, but they would go to Tajikistan and Mongolia and Uzbekistan or, and Kyrgyzia, I should say. Uzbek is no border. All around China, and they would start pressing, and of course, the Russians. See, the Russians are not our friends. They're not the friends of the Maritime Alliance. But if we drop the ball really badly and the Chinese begin to prevail, the Russians will be forced to side with us against the Chinese. So Putin may love Xi Jinping, but then again, Stalin loved Hitler and hated Churchill, but the logical strategy forced him to fight Hitler on the side of Churchill. In the First World War, the Tsar loved the Kaiser, and of course, his fellow emperors, and he was forced to side with the French Republic and the British, the Reverend British. So history will definitely repeat itself if we screw up, if we fail, to balance China. Why? Because it's not us who threaten control of Siberia. The all of Eastern Siberia was acquired in 1860 by what the Chinese call is an unequal treaty. There are very few people there. The population is very small and it's been declining. Vladivostok is the only city of any size and it's not that big. And therefore, in the long term, the Russian hold on Siberia is weak. It's threatened by simply the Chinese and not by us, and that will force it. So when I wrote all these fanciful things, they were fanciful, so they were projections. Yeah. This yeah. will happen, yeah. that will happen, that will happen as if I were a prophet, not an analyst or somebody, uh, an academic or intellectual. I wrote prophetically in these terms. Then the, what happened was that people came to me with very reasonable objections. They said, you have Japan uh, building itself up militarily and reinforcing the alliance with the United States in your projection. But look, the prime minister is Naoto Kan. Naoto Kan is a neutralist. The political boss is Ozawa. And Ozawa is an anti-American neutralist. And I said, it doesn't matter because strategy is stronger than politics. The logic of strategy would drive the Japanese right. to be as good as allies they ever were, plus build their own military strength, strengthen themselves, and start developing relations with India and Australia to coalesce, to do the coalition. They, other people came to me and said to me, Edward, we're very surprised at you because you travel, you're quite familiar with India, you go there often. Don't you know that the Prime Minister Singh believes that the only focus of the Indian government should be economic development. And he's already said that if the Chinese step across the border in Ladakh or whatever, he doesn't care about it, what they do in this trackless frozen wastes. He doesn't care. And I said, doesn't matter because the logical strategy will bring a government to India, which will act out the requirement, namely strengthen India militarily, strengthen the alliance with the United States, develop relations with the other coalition members, Japan, Australia, and so the crisis that happened last week, by the way, it was the, the Chinese sending tanks and artillery to the Aksai Chin Ladakh border in response to Indian road building. And how did the road building occur? Japanese aid. Japanese aid to, in, to India is very peaceful, very, very, very peaceful. It's just road building. But the road building enables the Indian army to reach those places. Hence the Chinese responded. So I have to I have to I have to tell you that uh, that, that those um, events happened. The border tensions with China happened between China and India. Just as I finished your book, and I and, and it was an amazing confirmation of your analysis, right in front of my eyes. Right. So, but 
I, the people who, uh, there's a famous, there, not famous, there's a well-known sinologist, Mike Pillsbury, who is, went to Andy Marshall, who commissioned the study from which the book, China, The Rise of China, Logical Strategy, came and said to him, don't, don't publish this study because the message is the United States need not do anything because in fact, this coalition will emerge anyway. And he says, that's totally wrong because the Japanese will fold. The Indians will fold. The Vietnamese will give up. And the reason is simple. He doesn't travel as I travel. He goes to China, but he doesn't go to these places. Therefore, he doesn't know what the temper of these people was. He never went and sat down with a Vietnamese official who calmly explained to him that if the Chinese Navy outpowers the Vietnamese Navy and they think that's the end of it, they will send people, guerrillas, into Yunnan province adjacent to Vietnam and start a war there. He doesn't realize that. Nor does he realize that when the Chinese asked for the islands they called Yao Tu Ya, which the uh, Japanese call Senkaku Islands, that the Japanese response would be, well, from our point of view, Senkaku Islands and Chiodaku is the same. Chiodaku is the core of Tokyo, which is the mm. big space with the imperial palaces. So, Mike Pillsbury knew China, and he's a serious fellow who studied Chinese, as I never did, even in spite of decades of interest. I should have studied and didn't because of my laziness. He was not lazy, but what he doesn't understand is that the logical strategy is rooted in a fundamental physiological fact, which is that Homo sapiens doesn't like to get buggered about. Homo <laughs> sapiens is a reactive being. You know, when you swim and you pick up, uh, I happen to love sea urchins. You pick up a sea urchin, it makes a little brief resistance, and then you take it home and you open it over your pasta to make the best possible spaghetti. With sea urchin, and, but human beings are different. They fight back. Moreover, if you attack a bunch of them, they coalesce against them. The logical strategy is driven by only that. And I was therefore either irresponsible or gripped by the power of these ideas because, you know, I wrote the book called The Logical Strategy, I mean, sorry, Strategy, The Logic of War and Peace, which presents this whole machinery. Strategy, The Logic of War and Peace, again, what you can be criticized as mechanical. Deterministic is a big word, right? It means right. that pay no attention to realities in human life and so on. And, but the principle is this, strategy is stronger than politics because politics is day to day and strategy is driven by the fundamental fact of security, survival, and not to, don't want to be buggered about by other people. The final point is about China, two things about China. Thing number one, the Chinese have delusions of adequacy in regard to the realm of strategy. The truth is that their history demonstrates that the Chinese are good at absolutely everything. Poetry, because of my laziness, I can only read Chinese poetry in translation, but let me tell you, it's sublime. Okay. They're great at poetry, they're great at production, at work, everything you want. The one thing that they've always failed at is strategy. Because strategy, as what I just said should indicate, involves knowing other people, knowing the Japanese, knowing the Indians, knowing the Vietnamese, and they don't. They I've, don't been, write I've, I've, really enjoyed, uh, I've really enjoyed reading their propaganda in the last few weeks because most of it is absolutely horrendous. I like good propaganda. And they have a lot to work with, especially with all the divisions among us right now. But, uh, right. but they're not, they're, 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 they're transparent. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, we, look, uh, they have used all the advanced techniques of what I call postmodern political warfare, social media and so on, to try and influence Hong Kong. Result, they became more anti-Chinese. <laughs> they tried to interfere in the Taiwan elections and the Taiwan elections started with a very popular opposition guy and ended up with the victory of the president who they described as anti-China. Why is that fundamentally? Because they're autistic. They're autistic. 
All great powers are autistic compared to sensitive little powers who are very aware of changes. But China being the biggest, uh, with the most people, very busy place with the flood, the earthquake somewhere in China and some part, are more autistic than the United States, more autistic than any, anybody else in history. And of course, their neighbor, Russia. The Russians are the opposite. They are no good at anything except strategy. That's <laughs> the world's largest country, the result of all their victories. The Russians do everything wrong, but they win their wars. The Chinese, on the other hand, until 1912 were ruled by the so-called Manju, the, the, the Qing dynasty. They called it in Chinese, but it was Manju. To the last day, they spoke Yurchen, which is a Manchurian steppe barbarian language in the court in Beijing. The Manchu ruled for 300 years. Before that, there was a Chinese dynasty, great exception, Ming. Before the Ming, it was the Mongols who ruled. Before the Mongols, it was another Yurchin dynasty, then the Kitai, etc., etc., etc. Even the Tang, the Tang that everybody thinks is so Chinese and so on, look at their pictures. It's all horses. And at the mm -hmm. Tang, they drank yogurt. In other words, they were a Turkic steppe dynasty. Why is that? Because every time three fellows on horseback would approach the Chinese border, the Chinese generals glittering in their beautiful brocades and, and uh, uniforms would swap clever quotations from Shunze, Sun Tzu, to each other. As if Sun Tzu is strategy. It's not. It's just tricks. Tricks. The whole of Sun Tzu is tricks. A couple of quotations. And while they were swapping these elegant quotations, the three barbarians would invade China, conquer it, and rule it for 100 years, 200 or 300. This is repetitive. And why? Because the peoples in the steppe, horsemen with bows, the way perhaps they were primitive, but they know the steppe. And they know that in a steppe, it ends with what is today Europe. It ends with what today is the Middle East, where there were always other powers. They were always aware of other powers, starting with the Chinese, of course, but all of the other powers of the great steppe ocean. And the Chinese don't. Their provincialism is complete. So much so that in 1979, when they invaded Vietnam, uh, with the approval of many people, they attacked Vietnam. They, it turns out that they knew nothing about Vietnam. Now, for a Chinese not to know about Paraguay is understandable. Right. Paraguay is a long way away, but Vietnam is adjacent to the border. What happened then, and it tells you everything you want to know, is that the Vietnamese crushed the Khmer Rouge, who were massacring the population in Cambodia, and they to, took over control of Cambodia, the Vietnamese. So the Chinese didn't want that because the Khmer Rouge were their allies. The allies, the Khmer Rouge were allies of the Chinese, and therefore the Chinese sent an army to the Vietnamese border, thinking that the Vietnamese would immediately withdraw their army to face the Chinese. Instead, the Vietnamese continued to take over Cambodia, and when the Chinese crossed the border, the Vietnamese contemptuously did not send the army to face them. They just activated their part-time militia, home guard, reserve people, you know, kinds of people with weapons of one sort or another. They inflicted so many casualties on the Chinese mm. that the Chinese gave up and retreated. Why did this happen? Because there was no knowledge of Vietnam in Beijing. How can you not know a country that is attached to China? And they've continued to do that. Underlying all this is the autism. Case in point, at this moment, there is a very strong US-China US quarrel. So the Chinese line should be that Trump is a maniac. The United States is a wild place with a wild president. We are reasonable, okay? And what did they do instead? In the same week, they sink a Vietnamese fishing boat in another claim to the ocean, right? They crossed the border into Ladakh and provoked an incident with India. <laughs> they condemned the Australian government because the Australian government asked the World Health Organization to investigate. So they started a huge quarrel with them and they declared war as it were on Sweden because the Swedes decided to close down 
the Chinese cultural institutes in Sweden because they were doing only propaganda and that kind of stuff. Right. So in the same week, you quarrel with Vietnam, with India, with Australia, and with Sweden. The week in which you were supposed to show tranquility, benevolence, peacefulness, and highlight the Americans and their craziness. So why do they do that? Because they're really, truly really autistic. They don't, this doesn't get to it. Now, if you talk to, to State Department people, they'll tell you, look, we have the State Department and we report back. If we have a consul in Tangiers, he writes notes to Washington saying what's going on. Their foreign ministry doesn't exist as a foreign ministry. All it, it is simply for propaganda. The, uh -huh. the, the Chinese ambassador in Paris sends no reports from Paris. If he does, nobody reads them. He sits in Paris and makes speeches. His speeches were so aggressive that the French President Macron said that he would expel him. But he didn't use the formula, uh, the formula, you know, persona non grata, you know, the official thing, a person who is not welcome. He said, vote. Vote is what you do with the garbage. You throw it out. <laughs> Why was that? Because the Chinese ambassador was trying to get attention in Beijing by being very aggressive. Loudmouth, what they call wolf diplomacy, wolf diplomacy, uh, which is another long story because the original Wolf Totem book was in fact a whole attack on Chinese sheep-like behavior and acceptance of Mao's dictation, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have here is the world's largest country is more autistic than, the, than other large countries. We Americans can be blamed for autism, for example, the fact that uh, General Mattis could go around saying the U.S. should send more troops to Afghanistan to help the Afghan army. Only people who have no awareness whatsoever of Afghanistan believe that there is an Afghan army. And there are <laughs> Afghans in Afghanistan. There are only Tajik, Uzbek, IMAX, Pashtuns, and so on. But never mind. So we're autistic. There are much more. Let me, let me, let me stop you there, because I th before we get into America's autism, I... Uh, I think you did a great job of laying out uh, your thinking. I have one little question about about this, uh, uh, about how you got to this uh, to this um, argument. And you you said you you realized that the real comparison was not with what China had done in the past, but between China and Germany. Uh, can you tell us uh, what sparked that? It's a great insight. It's uh, you know another land power bumping up against a lot of impediments, but with all of these great attributes. What? How, how did you did you just wake up one morning? Did you have a conversation with somebody? How did you get there? What happened is that many years ago, when I attempted to write this book called "Strategy: The Logic of War and Peace," okay, this book has been translated in many languages, and I am hated by numerous military officers in many countries because when they go to the National War College or their war colleges, they force them to read this book, okay? Um, the U.S. Uh, war College book on strategy has the following names on it. It has uh, uh, Machiavelli, Clausewitz, um, Shunze, and Lutwak. Okay, the others are dead. Okay. When I was gripped by the study of strategy, it suddenly occurred to me that if it this was either rubbish, the whole paradoxical, it's the paradoxical logical strategy, you know, which is that if you want to invade, um, you want to go from Washington to New York in, in, in peacetime, you go on the, on the uh, you know, on the New Jersey Turnpike, the straightest road, but if you do it in wartime, you will go on anything but the New Jersey Turnpike. They're all waiting for you. You'll go by sea, you'll go by mountains. So when I started delving into this, it suddenly occurred to me that either strategy was a load of balls and the whole thing was wrong. And I shouldn't be distributing books in 23 languages claiming that strategy has a logic at all, or else I was taking away human agency from it. I was saying that, as I did, I said, I don't care who is the prime minister in Tokyo, because this shall happen. The right. prime minister will change, the politics will change, 
And same story in India and the same story everywhere with this one. And if you say uh, that, what you're saying is that the Japanese cannot choose the prime ministers. Or rather, they can choose the prime ministers, but the prime ministers cannot choose to be neutralist if, or peaceful or whatever. They'd be forced to start building Japanese strength against China, coalescing with the Australians, the Indians, and the Americans, reinforcing the Japan-US security system. And if they didn't, they get swept away by other people. So yes, that is how it all happened. And then I look for the closest precedent a country which had risen from division, division split up. You remember that uh, the Kaiser's Germany of 1914 had been um, until just uh, two generations before, it was uh, Württemberg and, and Bavaria and the kingdom of Saxony. There was a whole conjury of states, some were pro-French, some were not, you know, and Germany was new, its unity was new. The German culture, of course, was not. They all had German kultur. They were all uh, were so defined, but they had no political unity. And Germany was known as the place of philosophers, composers, and watchmakers. Gemütli, very kind people, artisans, and so on. The f who were the fighters in Europe? Who were the formidable warriors? Were the French, the French. Who are the countries that invades everywhere? Invades, dominates, is the French. Before Napoleon, the French kings kept invading Germany. Then Napoleon invaded everywhere. Yeah. So the Chinese, I saw the Chinese would be, once they have geographic political unity within the borders established by the Manchu, which is a bit of a joke that the Chinese claim Tibet. It is as if, you know, when the British Empire broke up, Ceylon or Sri Lanka would claim to rule India because they've both been ruled by the British. So the fact is, I, when I saw that economic development that was lifting China from abysmal poverty and the toilet existence of Chinese cities into, you know, oh, what they are now, I saw them elevating, I could see changed attitudes. There, there is this uh, fabulous, um, uh, vice foreign minister of Mongol origin, a beautiful uh, woman. And suddenly, 2009 it was, she started talking differently. There was the financial crisis in 2008. Right. They grossly overinterpreted the financial crisis. It's like now, they thought it's the end of the United States. They have no, being autistic, they have no understanding of the United States. They don't know that the American Revolution started in 1776, that it has never ended. It takes naps now and then. <laughs> it be revolutionary, but don't go against them because they'll smash you, uh, even if they have to invent a whole new technology to defeat them. So the, this beautiful woman, the Mongol ethnic foreign vice foreign minister, who was very smooth and gentle, suddenly says, America down, China up, her m muscles moved. Her elbows became rigid. And this reminded me, of course, of the whole thing about the, the, re -emerge, the emergence suddenly from all these German composers and craftsmen and philosophers, the Prussian. The Prussian who would go in uniform everywhere, even if he was a professor at the university, he wore his uniform because he was a reserve officer. And the most famous professors in Germany were very proud to put the uniform on and salute some half illiterate, you know, uh, mar uh, sergeant because he made it, yeah. And I could see that happening in Beijing. Oh, it was now, working its way through that culture. Now I had, uh, when we started, I said, I'd, uh, my idea was we'd go with the, your analysis and then what America should do and then to human agency, but maybe we'll reverse that a little bit because you just raised this issue of human agency and I'm, I'm curious to get your thinking because, uh, you know, in, in a sense, you, what you said is there are these fundamental structures that, uh, you know, as you said, it doesn't matter who's the, who's the prime minister in Tokyo. Um, you know, he's going to end up understanding what he's, what he's got to do. So, but it seems to me that, you know, there's a place in your thinking for, for proper uh, strategic thought. 
and for human agency. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the, uh, wh where's the space for human agency? The space for human agency is that occasionally there are people who may not be very intelligent, may not be great experts or great anything, but who feel into it the logical strategy converging on the situation, who then act on that basis. And then in retrospect, looking back on it, we see that human agency intervened to understand the logical strategy and obey its instructions. Give you an example. George Bush Sr. was never accused of being an intellectual. But when the, the armed forces of, of the United States with some of its allies, it took back Kuwait in 1991 and stood there on the Iraqi border, the people who understand nothing about strategy said, we have, we've been building up, that was building up in Saudi Arabia and so on for months since August 2nd, when Saddam invaded Kuwait from August 2nd to January 26th or whatever that was, that they crossed into Kuwait. We've been building up hundreds of thousands of troops and now we just crossed Kuwait, which is a little place, a little tiny place. We should move to Baghdad and maybe to Damascus and straighten up the Middle East. Instead, George Bush said, stop. And he got away with it because Colin Powell, had being a veteran of Vietnam, was so ravished by the pleasure of having won a war without casualties, without yeah. body parts, practically, that he went along with it. And the people who don't understand strategy all wanted him to continue and afterwards even berated him for not having stopped right there. But Bush understood it. Why did he understand it? Because he had appointed himself Secretary of State during the buildup from August 2nd, 1990, so-called Desert Shield, and he had personally recruited the Allies, one by one. Some of them very reluctant because Bush wanted to have everybody with the Americans, absolutely everybody. Uh, and the Russians not, but the Russians were neutral, in effect. So therefore, he was very keenly aware of the fact that if American forces got beyond Kuwait, some of the allies would drop out and would begin the ineluctable process where you, according to the logical strategy, you reach the culminating point of victory. And if you persist, okay, you did things and you got to the victory. All you have to do is to persist in doing what got you the victory and you will go down slowly towards defeat because all victories if continued long enough, become defeats. Because according to the paradoxical logical strategy, everything has to turn into its opposite. For example, peace, if you take, once peace becomes really peaceful and people give up weapons and all that kind of stuff and they say, well, we're spending all this money on preparing you know, for war and some, that is when you have the conditions where war comes. Because if you don't believe that war is possible, your diplomacy might be irresponsible. You start talking big, you start talking big. At the same time, you don't acquire strength because you believe war is impossible. That's when war comes. Peace, how did every war in history ever become? It was peace that became war because people continued doing it and didn't change. And how does every war end? except the war in Afghanistan that Mr. Mathis would like to continue forever. <laughs> Every war ends because people get exhausted. Their resources become exhausted, but also their concept of what it takes for them to stop. Before, they were willing to stop so long as you give me this rich province, plus compensation, plus this, plus that, plus recognize me as the emperor of what to do. Uh, and then, as you take casualties, casualties, you reduce your demands, finally, you reduce them, you must still get a lot, but you reduce them greatly, and so on. So war becomes peace. Peace becomes war. That's the logical strategy. That is why, if you ever feel really secure, watch out. <laughs> then you're going to get zapped. Now, the Chinese are blessedly unaware of all this. So unaware that Xi Jinping, in the midst of a huge quarrel with the United States, 
when he has so many ways that he could enlist everybody on his side, decides that he, this is a great moment to start a quarrel with the kingdom of Sweden. He starts threatening Sweden. Are we going to have the Chinese cavalry ride across the Russian steppes and go up to Scandinavia? I mean, this is really, sh shows you the depths of the blindness, no different than Germany, that between, in between 1906 and 1914, turned every country against them. But the, but the um, of course, the, the, the analogy between uh, China and Germany, um, if taken to its, uh, you know, if taken too literally, um, could also lead to the suggestion that we're in for two major wars with China before they're, uh, <laughs> before, uh. Uh, before, before we, before we get them, uh, um, we get their autism under control. Right. So, so wars, how yeah. Do we, how do They're we not, prevent that? Okay. With Germany, the First World War was a frontal combat war. This, the Second World War involved the physical conquest of German territory right down to the room where Hitler was sitting. Um, there is a new fact on the scene, and that fact is nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons were born already before the first one ever exploded. General Leslie Groves, who was in charge of the Manhattan Project, because he had built the Pentagon building, the world's biggest building in 10 months or whatever, Groves asked a scientist, how powerful is this nuclear weapon? And um, the scientist said to him, is it like uh, the equivalent of a thousand um, tons of high explosive or 500? And the scientist says, we have no idea. Actually, we don't know. Maybe when we start the nuclear detonation, we will simply continue until the whole Earth is consumed, maybe the universe. But we think that it will be much more than that. It will be gigantically more. Nothing you could confuse with the bomb. So Grove said, oh my God, this is terrible. I'm wasting my time. The politicians will never use it. In other words, the nuclear weapon was born already exceeding the culminating point of utility. Mm -hmm. You see, I actually, uh, I like knives and I have fought with knives. I've defended myself with knives and some knives are better than others. But a knife that would be really good would be, uh, that could keep the enemy away would be six feet long, 10 feet long, 100 feet long. Well, there's a certain point where a knife is too good it exceeds the culminating point of utility. Nuclear weapons were so born. The fact that they were used against the Japan is a tribute to the magnificent Japanese resistance in Iwo Jima and Okinawa. They faced the Americans with the prospect of losing a million, a million men, two million men, and killing, I don't know, 20 million Japanese. Otherwise, since that moment to today, nuclear weapons have exceeded the culminating point of utility. Hence, any thing we have with the Chinese is going to be skirmishes. Like these little bases they're built in the South China Sea by turning coral reefs, shoals, and tiny rocks into bases by adding cement, 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 and building these bases so we might grab those bases. They might do other such things. That would be the maximum level. In other words, any fighting would have to be below the threshold where anybody in Washington or Beijing could even begin to talk about nuclear weapons. If it approaches the point where anybody could even contemplate the use of nuclear weapons, it would have to stop. And the alternative, of course, would be proxy engagements. Right. Uh, which, uh, you know, in theory, that they would subvert, um, I don't know, some place that they can reach and then we would counter it and that kind of stuff. Less likely. So how do you envision the, the, the coming rivalry between the United States and, uh, and China? You, you envision that as um, one of um, possibly skirmishes like you're talking about, but primarily then economic competition. Is that the, right? Is what that I wrote in the book, what I wrote in the book back then, all those years ago, is that they become a geoeconomic competition. The geoeconomics, Wikipedia says that I invented it. But all it is, is the logic of strategy, but in the grammar of commerce. 
the grammar of industry, of technology. You do the same thing as you would do in the strategy, but instead of using infantry and cavalry, use technology. I said that it will become a geoeconomic confrontation, which would be a question of economic leverage, economic capacity, technology, and all the rest of it. That will be the confrontation. However, I might say that the one thing I totally failed to anticipate in my book completely is that the Chinese would evolve backwards politically. Because when I was writing the book, Hu Jintao was just coming in as the and he was primus inter pares, the first among equals. There were seven members of the standing committee who really were a committee and made decisions. His prime minister, Wen Jiabao, was very effective and powerful. And uh, Xi Jinping himself was a modest person, modest. And Wen Jiabao was modest. The political remember were modest people. I thought that going from Mao, who know it all, it would be an evolution to Hu Jintao, and then they might diffuse power, not just in the Politburo, but in the Central Committee, where there are two or three hundred and some, and then further diffusion. I never expected. There will be a reversion to a character who likes to pose in uniform. He's never uh, served it one day, Xi Jinping, who would then centralize power, take power away from party secretaries to himself, so he now has to make decisions for 1.4 billion people. Before he turns to foreign policy, he has to do that. Uh, he has no knowledge to the outside world whatsoever. The one trip in which he was followed and tracked and listened to was to Mexico City. And what he said was outlandish, totally outlandish. He has no knowledge of the outside world, none whatsoever, or awareness of it. Otherwise, how else could he have quarreled with Vietnam, Sweden, Australia, and India the same week. So Xi Jinping goes. Xi Jinping has already caused Chinese students to lose access to American universities. Right. Chinese researchers to be kicked out from European research centers as well as American ones. To have Chinese importers thrown out in Australia. They go to Australia and say, you depend on our purchases of your raw materials and you better watch out and the Australians say our foreign policy is not for sale. So Xi Jinping has caused real damage to Chinese students, researchers, exporters, importers, bankers, industrialists, people like Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, he resigned from Alibaba, gave up all positions. The, one of the most famous Chinese artists, Wei Wei, is living outside China. He has caused huge damage to many Chinese. We're talking millions and millions through his anti-American policies. Secondly, he has antagonized many people in the Chinese Communist Party through his anti-corruption campaign. Now, when you join the Communist Party, you, the motto is we serve the people. So the salaries are very low and they used to make money on the side because their wives, sorry, Sorry about this, I stop it. The wives were in business. So you would meet a, a bureaucrat, a, you meet a Chinese bureaucrat, and he has a BMW. And you, and you say, how do you buy a BMW on your party salary of $300 a month? Oh, my wife is a businesswoman. Well, Xi Jinping stopped all this, stopped all this. He stopped it with his anti-corruption campaign, which people applauded, you know, as a wonderful thing. But it means the party members don't have either a good salary or corruption. In other words, what are they supposed to live on? So, so she may fall tomorrow morning. Oh, okay, you, so you're, I was wondering yeah. how you, we were talking about economic competition, right. and then you went to his, uh, to his moving Correct. backwards. So you're saying that, so you're saying that, that the- He's a dictator, right? So the, the, have many powers and many luxuries, but not one they don't have. They don't have the truth. Huawei, Huawei never told Xi Jinping that all their technology depends on American licenses and cross licensing, all of it. And that if they, if, if the Americans get annoyed, they can shut down Huawei with a phone call. Trump can call, pick, pick up a phone, which he did, by the way, with ZTE, ZTE, which is 
less known than Huawei, but it's huge company all over the place. Trump was going to pick up the phone and prevent Qualcomm or whatever supplying it with integrated circuits. Ziggy closes. Vast enterprise, right? So Huawei is a vaster, even bigger enterprise. Now, do you know what it's living from? It's inventory of integrated circuits purchased in the last year with the, with the rising tensions. Once they run out of those integrated circuits, they're out. And moreover, naturally, they have no access to the new ones. So Xi Jinping has done enormous damage, partly because as a dictator, he was lied to. Lied to. I mean, the, the, you know, they're all lying to him. The, the Swedish, the, the Chinese ambassador in Stockholm did not write home saying, if you say another thing, the Swedes will expel us all meaning the cultural institutes and all the presence. Well, you, 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 you basically answered my next question. Let me go ahead and ask it and see if, you, if, if it, it, it sparks any thoughts in your mind. But I was, what I was going to say to you was that if we're coming to this um, economic competition and it's going to be a geoeconomic uh, rivalry and we're going to have to use economic tools as, uh, as sort of tools of war, the, the Chinese are better organized for that kind of competition than we are. But you've just sort of answered it and say, no, that's not the case. No, they are better organized because American bankers, American businessmen, um, they pursue the logic of their own business and they don't care about the national purpose. Uh, and legally speaking, um, the US government cannot start going around doing Chinese communist kind of things like telling yeah. people this and that. But the problem is technology. And okay, the Chinese are not able to make a competitive jet engine. A, a jet engine for fighter aircraft, you need what they call a low bypass turbofan. And for a civilian high bypass turbofan. And for all the great abilities, they cannot make a decent jet engine. Their Air Force, their military airplanes rely on either Russian imports or copies of Russian imports. And they can't make integrated circuits. And what's in common between the two is that integrated circuits are manufactured. You have to have machines that can cut silicon with the precision of seven nm, seven nanometer, that is, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter, okay? This is a meter, yeah. one billionth, visualize. The machine can cut it, can cut it at the precision of seven nm. Now, to make such machines, like to make jet engines, you have to have teams of scientists, technologists, and workers, all three of them, working together, working together, and for a period of seven, 10, 12 years, that's as long as it takes to make a new machine. They're working, they've been working now for about seven, eight years on the new machines that can cut five nanometer and they've been at it for seven years, they probably need a few more. Now, what happens in China is that Mao Zedong destroyed Chinese families. He destroyed Chinese communities. He destroyed religion. He destroyed everything that binds people together. So it made them very free. Hence, enormously able to innovate commercially, to have new businesses, new type of stuff, and all the kind of innovation you can do with one good idea and just do it. Unfettered by kinship obligations, family things like, oh no, my second cousin's wedding is coming up, therefore I can't do and open that factory. And so all the things that impede India prevent India from innovating, which is family obligations, you know, all the customs, the rules, the regulations of castes and so on. Mao destroyed them all, prepared China for capitalism by making everybody totally free as an independent entrepreneur. Unfortunately, to develop high technology, you need team spirit, you need continuity, you need loyalty, and there is none in China. So for example, in Xi'an, where they make jet engines, their worker goes to work and he's good, you know, he's a highly skilled worker. He gets intercepted by an entrepreneur who says, look, I have a, a machine shop. 
nothing so exalted as this jet engine place, but if you live there where you're just a worker and you come to me, you'll be the technical director. Or different, you might have a brother-in-law who calls him from Shenzhen and say, you're doing jet engines, that's great. I just have a stupid noodle shop, but I'm making a hell of money, so come and join me making noodles, and he leaves. In other words, they keep approaching the jet engine the, the, it's called the WS-10 High 9, they got it. Now they're working on WS-15. They keep approaching the point where it works when the team falls apart. Same thing for integrated circuits and everything to do electronic. Interesting, interesting. Right, so, so the only computers they can make on their own are supercomputers because supercomputers are big enough, the mega computers to have a whole air conditioning plant. So it doesn't matter if the individual integrated circuits are this big, this big and generate a lot of heat because you have all the space you want and the heating. But in a laptop, a missile, a, a, a telephone, forget it. It has to be really small and they But can't. if they can, uh, it, 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 um, if we're not, why, why, are, why are metals and integrated circuits, why is this going to be, uh, uh, why is this going to be the key as to who wins the economic competition? Because as you know, in, there's been a transformation that started you know, in the 19th century, but which has been accelerating, whereby the content of the total economic activity is ever more technological. It's, the content is more and more technological. The material part, you know, the, the metals, the whatever, is less and less important, gets trivialized, and it is technological, whether that technology under whatever categories. For example, when you buy a, a suit made by Balotelli in Rome or one of those things, or Armani, or uh, the raw material value, that suit costs a really good suit in Rome from a really good tailor costs about eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. The actual raw material value of it could be $50, right? Mm -hmm not $50 plus $2 of work, it's thousands of dollars in making a wonderful suit that makes you look much taller and younger and better looking and very little raw material. And when it comes to the computer I'm talking to you on, laptop, okay, the, all the material content thereof is trivial compared to the technology in it. Therefore, the geoeconomic competition, which is the logic of, I mean, it's a logical war because you have, instead of invading the country, you, you invest a lot and you take over industrial leadership in a sector, okay? Whether it's making buckets or making something else. The, in that thing, the technological content keeps increasing. And within that technology is the cutting edge stuff. Okay, so listen, one last question and then I'll-, I'll let you... Far stronger in innovation because Imagine you're doing artificial intelligence in China. They have a huge advantage because they have all these, so many people and data. But look at the research group. They're all Han Chinese. They've all studied at one or two or three places in Shanghai and Beijing. They're highly homogeneous. And the one thing we know about innovation is that it always comes from marginal people, incremental people, and you need heterogeneity. Manhattan Project, a Hungarian, um, Hungarian refugee, a Jewish refugee from Hungary, quarreling with the German physicist, the Jewish refugees from Germany, with the Californian uh, physicist, you know, barely not even understanding each other. In three years, they invent gadgets, diffusion, fission, fusion, every damn thing there is. Through a, a, a Manhattan Project was undoubtedly the most diverse group of people who ever walked the earth in cultural terms and every other way. They're trying to do research and development with completely homogeneous people. And, and you think we haven't, yeah. lost, we, we haven't lost that quality? No, absolutely not. Of course not. Just see, I mean, go visit those establishments and-, and because, in because sometimes it feels like we're an empire in decline. Well, the United States, um, the United States was doomed from the beginning because a bunch of revolutionaries set up a constitutional system 
which appears to be programmed to cause endless quarrels and failures and all that stuff. It's only that it is the superstructure to a living body, which keeps getting bigger, 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 stronger, stronger, more developed, more skilled, more cultural in every way. I mean, there are places in the United States where they have the world's leading experts on medieval Tibetan poetry, right? It's one of the things we have in America. So on top of it, there's a political system which was rigged to prevent American presidents from being effective by, you know, they can't spend a penny, one dollar without Congress, you know, Congress allocating to them and all these other things that you know. So that project, the American rebellion against King George III, you know, if they hadn't rebelled, the queen of England would be our queen. You know, and then we'd have the pleasure of seeing her ride a horse at 93 or whatever she is and make a speech. So the, the American Revolution started in 1776. It's never ended. Sometimes takes a nap. And revolutionaries of this kind always are on the veg, verge of completely collapsing. But they rely on foreigners. Foreigners. When the Roosevelt did not know how to get out of the Great Depression. They tried this, they tried that, everything failed. But then Hitler shows up and the Japanese. So we rearm. You know, <laughs> it failed. All these people who invoked the New Deal, it failed. The economy was not developing, but we armed for war. So all the problems in the United States are caused by peace. And they're all so. <laughs> so this is going to be a non a war without shooting. All right. Well, listen, uh, this has really been fascinating. Uh, uh, I hope, uh, you know, as, uh, as this channel grows and takes over the world as it's destined to do, I hope we can uh, have you back um, to, uh, uh, well, actually, before you go, let me ask you this. Uh, suppose that you had a, uh, an elevator conversation with Donald Trump and you wanted to give him you know, the three key points or the one key point of what he should do uh, in order to uh, prepare himself to compete with the Chinese effectively uh, or to compete with the Chinese effectively. What would you tell him? What's the one thing you'd like to see him doing that he's not doing? Be quiet, stand out of the way, and let them destroy themselves. <laughs> so let the logic of strategy let it let and them the let them drive the Australians and the and the South and, Koreans and, and the Japanese. You're antagonist, when you're antagonist in the middle of a Chinese U.S. spat, or more than a spat, a real big quarrel, decides to sink a Vietnamese fishing boat, causing a Filipino protest because they same thing, quarrel with the Kingdom of Sweden, quarrel with Australia, quarrel with India, all in the same week. What you have to do is to shut up and get out okay. of the way. Let him destroy okay. So by the paradoxical logic of strategy, as you have defined it, some of Trump's arguing with allies and some of his being an, uh, what, what people like Jim Mattis would call an unreliable ally is actually the smarter strategy. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Because... It forces these countries to confront the prospect of living in a Chinese world. Right. The Americans do the heavy lifting, then they can stand back and say, oh, the Americans are overdoing it. You know, they're being too tough with the Chinese. The more we let them experience. See, that was the quarrel between me and the famous Mark Pillsbury. I mean, uh, he was concerned that the allies would fold. I knew that they would react. And if, if for example, um, you know, did, did the United States have to intervene in Sweden to prevent Sweden being taken over by Chinese propaganda enterprise called the Confucius Institute run by the Hanban in Beijing as a political penetration operation? No, we just let them do it to the point where what happened was that there was uh, somebody, some Swedish tour, student puts up a poster about the Uyghur, the repression of the Uyghur. Because this Xi Jinping puts uniforms on himself, pretending to be a soldier, actually thinks like a street policeman. So when a student puts it up, 
And what happened was that a Chinese employee of Hanban tears down the poster, saying that's an attack on China, not realizing that Swedes are not people you tread on, okay? Best thing that happened, the, Sw the Swedish government kicked them out. Just like in, the ambassador in Paris forgot himself, and he doesn't realize that the French have conception of themselves, that when there's trouble in Africa, the president sends troops there, they fly overnight, don't bother about vaccinations, and they go and do it. In that country, he starts insulting the French. And then the Macron said, on va vous voter. Voter. Voter is what you do with the garbage. Okay? So tell President Trump that the best way of dealing with the Chinese is to silently support countries that they attack. But please let them act out and don't do anything. <laughs> All right. Well, that's great advice. Listen, uh, thanks a lot. This was a really Thank a lot you. of fun, and uh, I hope to see you back here. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.